This is chapter 25. It deals with the pathogenic RNA virus. This now. RNA viruses um, are the only type of organism, if you want, uh, or agent that carries the genetic information in RNA. Usually genetic information is stored in the DNA. But the RNA viruses don't have any DNA, so they're going to store it in the RNA. How do we classify them or put them into categories? Number one, by their structure in terms of are they single-stranded, double-stranded? Uh, is there an envelope present or not? Is there uh, the capsid? What is the shape of it? What is the size of it? And so there's four different types of RNA viruses, or four different groups of them. There's what we call a positive single-stranded RNA. There are what we call retroviruses, and these have a positive single-stranded RNA, but they're going to convert that to DNA in the process of replication. There's also negative single-stranded RNA, and then there are some double-stranded RNA. Uh, what the positive RNA uh, refers to is that that ribosome can be directly used to translate um, and, and produce proteins. What would happen with a negative RNA strand is that it has to be uh, transcribed to make the messenger RNA, and then it would have to have translation occurring. Uh, the positive RNA strand goes straight to translation. We're going to go through the different groups, talk about them, and talk about some of the various diseases that they can cause. Now, this first family, uh, the Picornoviridae, or oftentimes pronounced picoRNA viruses, if you're familiar with the metric system, pico is a unit uh, of measurement. There are a thousand pico units in a nano unit. So that name of this family tells you when you break it apart that it's an RNA virus that's very, very small, and it is indeed the smallest of all the animal viruses. It does contain several different human pathogens in this family. Um, it, remember with viruses we don't uh, use the terminology of genus and species, but we do have family names for them. Uh, there are different genera, the rhinovirus, the enterovirus, and the heptavirus. Now larger than the picornaviruses are some additional families. Uh, three of them, as listed here, do cause some gastrointestinal diseases. This is a picture of what a rhinovirus, uh, one particular strain, looks like. Uh, you're going to notice that there's a lot of different um, diseases that can be caused by some of these viruses. A lot of these are going to uh, be respiratory infections. And in this table, it is showing you some of the, uh, for respiratory infections, various types of specific uh, diseases or manifestations of them as well. So things like the common cold, which is caused by a virus, rhinovirus is one of them. Uh, you're going to have sneezing, have congestion, runny nose, coughing. And the thing I want you to look at is the symptoms of it, the manifestations. A lot of them are fairly uh, similar, so it can be very hard to distinguish from one to another. The rhinoviruses, um, that is the causative agent of most of your colds. Usually the infection is uh, dealing with just the upper respiratory tract. A single virus particle is enough to cause the symptoms. It's enough to cause uh, this, the cold itself. How is it going to be transmitted? It's transmitted by fomites, those inanimate objects. Once again, it can be transmitted in aerosol. It can be transmitted in hand-to-hand -hand contact. Usually, uh, if you go back and you find a patient who is sick and you start looking at the history, how might they have contracted it, it's usually direct person-to-person -person contact. Now, over time, people will acquire uh, some immunity to the 
particular what we call serotype or the strain that infected them, um, which is why you tend to have fewer colds as you get older because you've got this immunity. The problem is with rhinoviruses, there are so many of the different strains of them. How are you going to diagnose it? Usually uh, by the symptoms. Treatment, there's some medicine that can help reduce the severity, help reduce the duration of it. However, it must be taken at the very beginning of the onset of symptoms. There are other medications that can help relieve the symptoms. Prevention, hand washing. Wash those hands. Some of your enteroviruses, how is it going to be transmitted? Usually by fecal oral route. It usually will infect the intestines. It can infect the pharynx. If it gets into the blood, then it can uh, spread to obviously other areas in the body. Uh, there are three main enteroviruses, the polioviruses, Kawasaki viruses, and echoviruses. If we look first at poliomyelitis, uh, the abbreviated name is polio. Uh, there are three different types of serotypes of polio that can cause uh, this disease. Now, the number of cases initially has gone down dramatically since uh, the advent of the vaccine. Now, there were four different types of conditions that could be caused by poliovirus. Asymptomatic infections, minor polio, non-paralytic polio, and paralytic polio. This uh, map shows over time from 2002, the middle is 2007, and then to beginning of 2015, uh, the number of wild cases of polio. Now, as you can see, it's decreasing. That's a good thing. There has been concern about, um, although numbers are decreasing over time, whether there may be some increase again. Look at the first six months of 2015, and you'll notice um, a lot of areas did not, most areas did not have cases of it. But there is one select area where it does look like the number of wild cases is increasing. Most of you are going to be young enough you don't remember seeing individuals who had suffered from contracting polio. Some people may have just had very mild symptoms. Others may have resulted with crippling paralysis. What happens with uh, polio is um, you end up having muscles that are affected by it that leads to the, the crippling effects from paralysis. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the number of cases has gone down dramatically since the development of the polio vaccine. So there's actually two different vaccines. One is an inactivated polio vaccine. This was developed by Jonas Salk. And then there's the oral polio vaccine, which was developed by uh, Albert Sabin. These were developed relatively at about the same time period. And this table shows the advantages and disadvantages of each one of those. Um, there's times when you may want to use one versus the other. With the polio vaccine, uh, one concern is that there have been some areas, including here in the U.S., where there's starting to be an increase in cases that can be directly related back to um, individuals not becoming vaccinated, and then they become exposed and then contract the disease. And one of the problems, I think, with this is that a lot of people mistakenly think, oh, that polio was eradicated. The numbers have decreased from what it was prior to the vaccines, but it has not been eradicated. And I think part of what also happens is that individuals 
younger individuals especially may not have the memories of knowing somebody who survived polio and may have had um, this crippling paralysis that's associated with it. They don't see that, so they have no frame reference for that. And therefore think, oh, well, I, I don't think this disease is not that bad. It doesn't exist. It is devastating if somebody contracts that. And so there's concern that as there are a group of individuals who choose not to vaccinate, to say, their children against polio, and yes, that's their choice, but if their child contracts polio, the results can be devastating. And it's one of those out of sight, out of mind things. They just don't think that, oh, it doesn't exist. We don't see it. It's not here. So there is some concern that there is starting to be a little bit of increase, as I said, in some pockets, some areas, increased numbers of polio. And it can usually be attributed to the lack of vaccinations. Other diseases of enteroviruses, you've got the Kasaki viruses and the echoviruses. These, the infection uh, is by the fecal oral route. Most of the time, the infections are going to produce uh, very mild symptoms, if not at all. Coxsackie A uh, can produce some lesions and fever. It's often referred to as hand and foot and mouth disease. Uh, it can cause some cold, some conjunctivitis, which is like pink eye. Here is hand, foot, mouth disease. Coxsackie B viruses. These can cause infections um, with the heart, myocarditis, and pericardial infections. Um, it can cross the placental barrier. Um, both Coxsackie A and Coxsackie B can also cause a form of meningitis. Echoviruses are going to be causing intestinal um, problems. Or that's the way they're ingested and, and then acquired is through eating contaminated food. Can cause meningitis and colds as well. These are found throughout the world. Um, they tend to be a little higher numbers in area where there's inadequate sewage treatment, which once again, this whole fecal oral route um, suggests that if you can provide clean drinking water, have proper sewage treatment, uh, so you're not exposed to that contaminated sewage water, that can do a huge, huge amount in trying to decrease these types of infections. Uh, once again, if the infection usually occurs from contaminated food or water, then clean up the food and the water supplies. As I said earlier, usually the infections are going to have mild symptoms. Um, it's usually not diagnosed unless it is a severe case such as meningitis. This whole chapter is dealing with viruses, so there's not always treatment for viruses. Uh, in this case, there is none. Just good hygiene, good uh, sewage treatment, as I said. There are some uh, vaccines that are effective for polio, but not necessarily some of the other viruses. We're still talking about the positive uh, single-stranded RNA viruses without uh, envelopes. Hepatitis A. Hepatitis A virus is going to be the causative agent. It can survive on a lot of different surfaces, and it is resistant to a lot of what you would classify as your common household disinfectants. It's transmitted through the fecal-oral route. Um, what are some of the signs and symptoms? Usually fatigue, fever, nausea, uh, anorexia, jaundice. This type of infection caused by hepatitis A virus does not cause the chronic liver disease like you see with hepatitis B. Usually recovery does occur, and it is a complete recovery. There is a vaccine that is available for hepatitis A. Now, there are different uh, types of hepatitis viruses. Um, I'll just let you know, if you look at an older book, they've changed the names. It used to be hepatitis A, hepatitis B. Then it was hepatitis non-A, non-B. And then they 
they went on from there. So now it's hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. Remember, hepatitis B is the only one that is a DNA virus. The other four have RNA. And this table uh, just show the comparison between them. About talks about the um, mode of transmission or the route of transmission, whether it's from needles, whether it's from sex, whether it's from the fecal oral route, etc. So it's a nice um, comparison chart. The Calisea viruses and astroviruses can cause acute gastroenteritis. So oftentimes you will see outbreaks associated with daycare centers, schools, hospitals. The Calisea viruses cause nausea, uh, diarrhea, vomiting. Um, noroviruses is a very common um, cause of some of the viral gastroenteritis. Astroviruses will also cause the diarrhea, but typically no vomiting. Treatment is going to be replace the fluids and electrolytes, prevent dehydration from occurring. How do you prevent uh, infections from ever even occurring? Once again, if you have adequate sewage treatment, adequate water treatment, wash hands frequently, uh, disinfect contaminated surfaces. Viruses in both of these families, the Calciburia and Astroburia, uh, have kind of a star-shaped capsid, so this is what it looks like under the electron microscope. Hepatitis V. Uh, this, the disease is usually sublimiting. It's transmitted by the fecal oral route. This virus can um, also cross the placenta barrier and is extremely dangerous, as you can see if a woman who is pregnant were to contract it. Now if you're looking at some of the envelope uh, single-stranded positive RNA viruses, Togoviridae and Flaviridae are both enveloped single-stranded positive viruses. Um, there's an arborvirase family that also is with this group that's transmitted by arthropods. And then the Coronaviridae. These are enveloped, but they're helical in their shape now. So remember how we classify them, whether they're uh, enveloped or not, and then by their shape of the capsule. So in this group, you're distinguishing between iso, um, icosahedral shape versus the helical shape. So you look at the shape of them. So here's togoviruses. And then here is the, um, an example of a coronavirus. Diseases of the arboviruses, there are zoonoses are diseases that are animal diseases that spread to humans. Uh, often they are transmitted by mosquitoes or ticks, and that's how it gets it from an animal host to humans. Um, the insect, the arthropod, remains, it's a, called a vector because it's transmitting it from one animal to another. It remains infected, uh, so they can be the source of several new infections. Infections tend to be mild, kind of flu-like symptoms in most cases. Um, arboviruses sometimes can end up with secondary infections or what we call second stage infections, which are more serious encephalitis, dengue fever, or yellow fever. Several different togoviruses can call encephalitis, cause encephalitis in both horses and humans. And so that's why it has the name equine associated with it. So Eastern equine encephalitis, Western equine encephalitis, or Venezuelan equine encephalitis. The normal host feels either a bird or a rodent, depending on which one you're talking about. The Eastern equine encephalitis is the most severe of the diseases in humans. West Nile virus uh, is a flavor virus. It was first introduced in the United States in 1999, so it's still classified as an emerging infectious disease. 
In most cases, it will be asymptomatic. However, in severe cases, the uh, human host can develop encephalitis. So this is showing how um, you've got the various hosts, you've got the vector, in this case it's showing as a mosquito, and how it can um, infect several different uh, animals, several different hosts, and eventually once a mosquito is infected, it remains infected, and so it can infect several different animals, including humans. For the human West Nile virus, um, just because you have the virus does not mean that you will end up with encephalitis. And so this table is showing from roughly 2000, 2015, on the graph in blue is the number of deaths, in red are the number of infections. So you can see how there have been peaks over time. Part of the, the peaks uh, that you may see here, something to keep in mind, if a mosquito is the vector, then it's probably not going to be very important in transmitting this disease, say, in the middle of winter. But then in the spring, summer, and fall, as the temperatures warm up, you would have an increase in the number of cases because you have an increase in the number of the vectors, in this case, the mosquitoes. If you can control that mosquito vector and prevent it, keep those numbers down, prevent it then from transmitting, transmitting the disease, then you would see a decrease in the number of cases. Diseases of your arboviruses, dengue fever is one. Um, this is endemic in Asia, South America, and Mexico. Disease usually has two different phases. Initially, you have fever, weakness, severe pain. Then the second phase, you get a bright rash and then fever. Um, no treatment is available, and uh, you can get a reinfection and get dengue hemorrhagic fever. As the name implies with hemorrhagic fever, there's often internal bleeding that can lead to shock and then can lead to death. This shows, it's kind of an interesting map showing the range of the mosquito that acts as the vector and then the areas of where we do see the endemic levels of the Danube fever. This table or chart is showing the pathogenesis of the hemorrhagic fever is that initially you have the fever, or the virus infecting. In this case, it tends to infect monocytes. You end up with the fever. You have recovery, um, and you do have the antibodies, which would be your typical response. Reinfection occurs, the virus, the antibodies are going to bind with that virus forming the complexes. Uh, that complex with the virus antibody is phagocytosed by your antigen presenting cells, your APCs, which then activate the memory T cells. That's going to trigger an increase in inflammatory cytokines, and then that's going to trigger some of the, the hemorrhagic fever, the uh, severe illness, internal bleeding, etc. And as you can see by the numbers, death, the numbers are way too high, <laughs> 10 to 50 percent. Yellow fever also is caused by arbovirus. It's uh, going, yellow fever, the disease itself, is going to lead to ultimately um, abnormal degeneration in the liver, the kidneys, the heart. Uh, mortality rate can reach up to 70 percent. Now, this is still a problem in other areas of the world than the U.S. 
A lot of people think, oh, that's a fever from a long time ago. Yellow fever doesn't exist anymore. Yes, it does. It's just that in the U.S. it's been pretty much eliminated because of vaccination and mosquito control once again. Um, but in other countries, it is still a problem. So this table is showing through the family of arboviruses, which is broken down to the Togoviridae, Flavoviridae, Bunyoviridae, and Rioviridae, uh, some of the different diseases, and then what the vector is, and a lot of them are mosquitoes, some of them are ticks, but a lot of them are mosquitoes. What is the natural host, where it's located, and then finally what the symptoms are. For diagnosis, treatment, and prevention, you can use serological tests to try to diagnose. Usually the only treatment is going to be supportive care, treat the symptoms. Prevention, once again, control those vectors. If it's transmitted by a vector, if you can break that transmission line, then you won't have uh, the outbreaks of the disease in the humans. There are vaccines for some, but obviously not all of these. Uh, some of the vaccines will be recommended to, to people who are traveling to an area where you know that these diseases are prevalent. Why? Because the virus is there. It's endemic. And so it, the recommendation would be if you're traveling to an area, then get the vaccine for it, prior, obviously prior to the travel. What are some other diseases of the envelope single-stranded positive RNA viruses? Rubella. This is the scientific term for German measles. The rubella virus is the causative agent. This is classified as one of your uh, childhood diseases. It does produce these skin lesions. Usually infection starts with a respiratory. Um, you inhale it and then it spreads throughout the body. You end up with uh, a rash. In children, rubella usually is not as serious Adults, it can be much more serious. Huge, huge concern is if a woman is pregnant and she becomes infected while pregnant. This virus can cross the placental barrier, as we do see with a lot of viruses, that they can cross the placental barrier. And it can be devastating. Um, depending on where she is in her pregnancy, when she gets infected, often determines how severe the outcome is. Um, there's vaccination that has uh, been very, very successful in reducing the number of cases of rubella. And usually if a woman is planning on getting pregnant, that is one question that they will ask, is whether she did receive the um, rubella vaccination. It's usually combined with what we call measles, mumps, uh, and rubella, the MMR vaccine. That's what the R stands for, is rubella. And so they will check to see if she's, um, like I say, planning on becoming pregnant then before and make sure that uh, has she received the vaccine, they may check if she's not sure to see if she has a titer level of antibodies. And if not, then give her the vaccine before she becomes pregnant. This is what um, the rash looks like from the, the rubella. Like I say, the common name is German measles. And this table shows with the introduction of the vaccine in the uh, late 60s and how the number of cases have come down. Now, <coughs> we have seen a little bit of an uptick um, and there, were, there was an outbreak in 2019 of measles and we also start to see an increase of German measles or rubella. Both of those were associated with people who had not been vaccinated. Hepatitis C. So this is another one with hepatitis viruses. This is a positive single-stranded one. Um, it, this is spread by needles, by sexual activity, and by organ transplants if the transplanted organ was contaminated. Um, 
it becomes a chronic infection, so long term, uh, can result with severe liver damage and ultimately liver failure over time. Um, right now, there is no vaccine available. Now, diseases of the coronaviruses. Um, this is a group of viruses. They're named because of the envelope. They do have spikes, and when you look at it on an electron microscope, it looks like um, they kind of have this halo, and so that's where it gets its name from. It usually causes upper respiratory uh, infections, and so it's transmitted by droplets from that respiratory uh, tract. Common cause of colds, one of the, the second most common cause of colds. Uh, there have been several what we call coronavirus respiratory syndromes. This includes SARS and MERS. SARS is Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome is what it stands for. And MERS stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. The symptoms of these uh, include high fever and uh, obviously it's an upper respiratory um, infection. So you may have shortness of breath. There is no vaccine currently available for SARS or MERS. There's treatment is just supportive treatment treating the symptoms. Um, to help prevent, it is recommended to use face masks and to quarantine infected individuals so that they will not um, pass this on and infect additional individuals. Now, I say this is, uh, there are several different symptoms associated with this. This is what the coronavirus looks like. You can kind of see that, what they're talking about with the halo, with the spikes that are off them. And then this is showing uh, individuals wearing the mask to try to prevent uh, increased spread of the infection. Uh, B is a picture of individuals in the Middle East with the MERS outbreak, and A is from China with a SARS outbreak that occurred um, in the early 2000s. Now, currently with uh, coronavirus, before I continue on, because as I'm making this, we're obviously dealing with a current uh, pandemic of coronavirus. Uh, the COVID-19, what that stands for is coronavirus disease, and the 19 stands for that it was first diagnosed in 2019. As many of you are aware, it was diagnosed in China in the fall of 2019. Similar, it is classified as a SARS, it's a severe um, respiratory acute respiratory disease or syndrome. So you do have that high fever, you do have that respiratory distress. Now if you're wondering why is it that um, this time with the COVID-19, this particular strain, why is it spreading so rapidly? Why are so many people getting sick? As I mentioned earlier with this, there's often an animal host, and this is a case where this particular strain was in another animal, and it did jump to humans, which we often see. However, this is the first time we have seen this particular virus. There have been other coronaviruses, but this strain, it's the first time it has ever been in humans, which means there is not a single person that has an immunity against it. That's one of the premises of the whole vaccination program is herd immunity. It's that if you can get the majority of the people protected against whatever microorganism it is, that helps to protect those who maybe cannot receive the vaccine. Say someone who's going through chemotherapy cannot receive a vaccine. And so by if you get most of the people surrounding them protected, then chances of that susceptible person getting sick are very slim. We don't have anyone protected because we've never seen this before. So everyone is susceptible to it. And that's why we've had the, the huge outbreak 
Number one, everyone is susceptible to it. Number two, for COVID-19, at least in every virus, as you know by now, and every microorganism, it's a little bit different. The incubation period is 14 days, and that varies. Well, 14 days can be a long time where you could have contracted the virus, not know it. You feel fine, but you are contagious. And you can pass it on to others. So by the time, maybe 14 days later, suddenly you start feeling sick, for two weeks you have been infecting other people unknowingly, but that's what's been happening. And some people may just get a mild form of the disease, but other people may get a very severe form. And that's where we're seeing, number one, we've had just sheer numbers. So many people said that it has started to overwhelm the healthcare systems. And unfortunately, because it is a respiratory disease, in the severe cases, oftentimes people are in such distress, they need help breathing. So they have to be placed on ventilators. Once again, just sheer numbers. Do you have enough? ventilators for the number of patients that you need and number one in certain groups of people also because their immune systems may be compromised they may not be working efficiently maybe they're older maybe they're fighting some other infection they're going to be at a higher risk for having a more severe case of it their body's already fighting something else and now you put this on top and you get a much more severe case. So the numbers have been going extremely high. You've seen the effect of global travel, of it moving from China to other countries such as Italy and Spain and then from the European countries to the United States. It's starting now to be seen in South America, Mexico, etc. Um, so you see the effects of global travel. And so as you have these high number of cases throughout the world, obviously that's that's pandemic. They're trying to get a handle on it. They're trying to have people, A, wear masks to help prevent the spread of it. They are trying to have people do the social distancing, keeping at least six feet away from each other. Once again, that would help to prevent the spread of it. Why do we not do these for other things such as the flu? Well, number one, we have a vaccine against the flu. So a lot of people have received that. So you have some people who are protected. You have some people who maybe contracted a particular strain of the flu last year and have built up their own natural immunity to it. The other thing is that the incubation period for influenza is not nearly as long as it is for the coronavirus. So as you guys are living through this, this pandemic, which, um, you know, use it as a, a learning experience, uh, here you go, microbiology in action with it. Retroviruses, these viruses are positive single-stranded RNA viruses. They do contain an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. They are a group of viruses that have been very highly studied. They do have capsids. They also have spiked envelopes around them. The genomes contain uh, the positive uh, RNA. Retroviruses play kind of by their own rules because they want to. They, they never read your micro book and biology books, and so they, they play by a whole different set of rules. Um, what they do is they have single-stranded RNA, as we just said. Now, instead of using that positive single-stranded RNA, which would usually go straight to uh, translation and make proteins, etc., no, what this does instead, it uses this enzyme, reverse transcriptase. So if you remember, transcription is the process of using DNA as a template to make RNA. If you're using a reverse transcriptase, you're going the other direction, which means you're going to use that single-stranded RNA 
as a template to make double-stranded DNA. Is it an extra step? Yes, it is. But it's going to do it anyway. There are two types of retroviruses. Uh, one type usually are oncogenic, meaning cancer-causing, and the other is mostly immunosuppressive. So what the reverse transcriptase does, this is just a visual description showing how in step one you've got that single-stranded RNA, the re enzyme, the reverse transcriptase, is going to come along and it is going to make ultimately uh, single-stranded DNA. So it's going to use that RNA as a template. It makes that single-stranded DNA. So for a short time period you have a hybrid. It looks like two strands. One's RNA, one's DNA. And then the RNA is going to disintegrate. It's going to break apart. So now you're just left with the single-strand DNA. So what does that do now? Well, now you have a single-strand DNA, so you're going to make use that as a template to make a complementary copy. So you make the other strand, so now you have double-stranded DNA. The oncogenic retroviruses, um, one is the human T lymphotropic virus 1, or HTLV1. Uh, usually it's identified with someone who has acute T cell uh, lymphocytic leukemia. There are different uh, proteins that it makes that activates um, cell growth. HTLV2 causes a rare type of cancer. It's called hairy cell leukemia. So far, HTLV5 has not been linked to cancer. And then your, your HTLV1 and HTLV2 are usually transmitted by sexual intercourse, blood transfusions, or contaminated needles. Uh, infections are going to be chronic. Long-term prognosis is not very good um, because it's transmitted by sexual intercourse, contaminated needles. In terms of preventing infections, it's going to have to be change of behaviors, very similar to what we've seen with HIV prevention. So this is um, a picture showing someone that has hairy cell leukemia and the type of what they call the extensions that you typically will see with someone who has this. The immunosuppressive retroviruses and uh, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, or AIDS. Um, AIDS is the syndrome. It's, a lot of people will say, oh, well, AIDS is the cause of AIDS. No, HIV, human immunodeficiency uh, virus, has. it is the virus that is the causative agent for the syndrome, which is AIDS. Um, usually what happens is there are certain infections that are fairly rare that typically are only seen with AIDS patients that can be used to help to essentially diagnose it. Um, you can have, can be diagnosed when you have those particular symptoms, you have a positive test for HIV and also a decreased number in helper T cells. So there's several different infections and diseases that are associated with AIDS. Now there's two major types of HIV, and it's kind of interesting that HIV-1 is most prevalent in the United States and Europe, and HIV-2 is most prevalent in West Africa. Because this uh, HIV virus and infection with it, with either a strain, ultimately results with AIDS. With AIDS patients, we do see, tend to see a lot of opportunistic type of infections as I said, associated with it because it's affecting the immune system, so it makes you more susceptible. This table is showing some of those uh, opportunistic infections that are often associated with AIDS patients. And it's broken down, as you can see, by bacterial infections. We tend to see an increased number of tuberculosis, uh, fungal infections like pneumocystis, uh, protozoan infections, viral 
induced tumors such as Kaposi sarcoma, viral infections. Um, so unfortunately, because as the name implies an immunodeficiency, um, it allows for several opportunistic infections to take hold. So if you look at the structure of the HIV, there's different glycoproteins that are found on the viral envelope. And um, some of these are attachment molecules of the HIV that allows it to attach to the target cell and um, do play a role in preventing the immune system from getting rid of the virus. So this just goes through some of the characteristics of the HIV um, and how they are targeting some certain things, targeting the helper T cells. Um, remember the helper T cells are the ones that are going to activate the entire humoral immunity, all the B cells. It also helps to activate cytotoxic T cells. So basically it's wiping out the part of the immune system that initially gets notified that, hey, we have an invader here and you need to notify everyone else. It's wiping that out. Where did HIV come from? Um, it's not 100% sure. They feel that it probably was a mutation from the simian immunodeficiency virus. Um, although there was a huge outbreak in the 1980s initially that was really identified, they think it may have been in the population in humans as early as the 1920s. And this is showing the replication cycle of the HIV virus. At first it has to attach, and part of it is those glycoproteins on the surface of the, the envelope of the virus. It's able to attach to the receptors, and then it enters the cell by endocytosis. So it doesn't break the code on the outside. It's just completely engulfed by endocytosis. And then typically what you would see is the uncoding. And then um, that double-stranded DNA is going to be produced from the single-stranded RNA, remember, by use of that reverse transcriptase. So now that you've made that double-stranded DNA, where does it go? It moves into the nucleus of this inside your cell and it becomes integrated in your DNA. So it, it um, basically kind of cuts your DNA in a spot and let me squeeze in here, places itself in there. And then later transcription can occur, making a messenger RNA, which is going to be start the whole process of assembly production, that the production line that you typically see with the viruses. Transcription is going to occur, making the RNA, making the proteins to make that envelope, assemble everything together, and then finally release it. Now this is just showing specifically as to how it does bind uh, to uh, the host cell and the way it's able to enter into the host cell. And once again, this just goes through what was seen in that previous pictures of the reverse transcriptase. Using the RNA as a template to make the double-stranded DNA, <coughs> the double-stranded DNA enters into the nucleus, integrates into the human DNA, at that point that's what we call the provirus because it's integrated into an animal DNA. And then that provirus, it can remain there dormant for years. It does not necessarily start right away with making new viral particles. It can start right away or it can just hang out there for years. Once HIV exits the cell, um, it, it takes components of the cytoplasmic membrane to make as part of its viral envelope. That's going to make it harder for it to be recognized as 
um, something for him. It is a combination of drugs that are used to help treat HIV. One thing is the protease inhibitor because protease is going to break down proteins that we know are necessary for helping to make some of the mature viruses. So what does the HIV uh, do? It, it's destroying your immune system, which is why it makes it uh, much more easier to develop these opportunistic infections. So if you look at these um, different lines on this, this graph, if you look at the red line, this is HIV in the blood, so the number of the viral particles in the blood. Early on in the infection, the numbers go up, and then it drops down. Why? Because the virus is hiding out in your cells. And then gradually over time, eventually it will uh, increase in the blood late in the infection. Antibodies is the purple line against the virus. Well, you can see initially the antibodies are high as the virus is high. It's trying to, to fight it. And then it kind of plateaus as the numbers have decreased because the virus is hiding out in your cells, so the antibody is going to decrease and eventually drop out. And then at that point, the virus is released and it's high in the blood again. The green, this is your CD4. These are your helper T cells. Initially, they're high when you have that primary infection. And then they go down. Because what is the virus doing? It has knocked out your CD4 counts. And then, as you can see, the progression of AIDS that green line, the CD4 cells, continues to drop over time. And years later, it's dropping dramatically. This is when if the helper T cells, which are involved with stimulating and activating your cytotoxic T cells, it's involved with helping to activate your B cells, which are the ones that are responsible for ultimately stimulating the production of the antibodies, which makes sense. If you don't have the help of T cells, they can't activate the B cells, which can't make the antibodies. So you understand why the green and the purple lines are parallel each other and that they're both dropping. The problem with this is um, it's wiping out the immune system, not just for fighting HIV, but everything else, which is why, as you can see, towards the end of the graph on the right-hand side, around number five, where you have an increase in opportunistic diseases occurring because you've wiped out the immune system. And now the virus, the number of viral particles in the blood is increasing because there's no immune system to wipe them out. There's no antibodies there to bind with them to make them more visible to your cytotoxic T cells. As I said, there's different... Um, other opportunistic diseases that are associated with uh, AIDS and there's other uh, more rare infections that typically are seen just with AIDS patients because of the opportunistic uh, fashion of it. So there is a thought that the HIV may have been present in humans in the early 1920s, but we don't know that definitively. In terms of the epidemiology of AIDS, AIDS was first recognized in young male homosexuals in the United States. And it is now found worldwide. It was in the early 80s when they started noticing that suddenly they were seeing some infections that were considered fairly rare and some infections that individuals were coming in with that were caused by opportunistic organisms that most of us have, but it doesn't do anything. But for some reason, you're suddenly seeing an increase in some of these unusual infections. Like, why now? What is the common thread? An epidemiologist is going to try to look 
<coughs> excuse me, uh, what is the common thread here? And they started noticing who are the individuals coming in? Is there any common thread? And yes, young male homosexuals. And so they, that's when they realized we may have a new disease here. And we need to find out what the causative agent is before we can treat it, really, or help treat it. You start treating symptoms, but really to long-term treatment, we've got to find out what we're dealing with. And then they found that HIV can be found in blood, semen, saliva, vaginal secretions, breast milk. Uh, blood and semen tend to be more infected than the other secretions. Um, so there must be some type of a, a tear to get through the skin or the mucous membranes of that infected fluid. The global distribution now of HIV and AIDS, as you can see on this map, it definitely is global now. Modes of transmission uh, in people over 12 years of age in the United States study was done in 2011. They looked at the numbers, and you can see here adult males versus adult females. That in males, it was majority was with male homosexual contact. Females, it was uh, usually with heterosexual contact. Some behaviors increase the risk for HIV infection. Uh, anal intercourse, sexual promiscuity, uh, IV drug use, or if you have intercourse with someone who fits into any one of those previous three categories. So a diagnosis is based on the symptoms, it's based on a low CD4 count and the presence of antibodies against HIV. Um, long term things um, they're trying to look at different testing to make um, testing easier and treatments easier right now for the treatment it's what we call antiretroviral therapy um, it's trying to prevent or at least reduce the replication of the virus and it's what we call a cocktail because you're using uh, a combination of antiviral drugs. It's not just one drug, it's, it's a combination. It does not cure the infection. Um, normally the patient can live a relatively normal life while on the treatment. Uh, the idea is that it reduces that viral replication so that an individual who is HIV could start this uh, cocktail and it doesn't progress to the later stages of AIDS. There are problems in trying to develop a vaccine because people often say, well, why don't we have a vaccine for this? Well, a vaccine, you must be able to generate antibodies and you have to generate, uh, use your cytotoxic T cells. Induction of some of the IgGs could be bad on some patients. Um, the problem also is there are different variants of the HIV virus, which means if you develop a vaccine, but somebody has a different variant, it may not work. Viruses can also spread directly from cell to cell, which means they may not be out and exposed to the antibodies. Um, and just in terms of developing a vaccine, normally with a vaccine, at some point you need to test it with individuals to see the effectiveness of it. And that brings up huge ethical and medical concerns. Um, you cannot do testing for a vaccine. I mean, where are you going to get volunteers? That is by no means ethical at all to ask someone to test a vaccine and the effectiveness of it with the disease when you know there's no cure. Prevention. Certain behavioral changes certainly has slowed progression. It's been fairly effective at, at kind of getting that peak down and, and keeping the numbers of new cases to slow. Behavioral changes such as abstinence, safe sex, use of clean needles, um, certainly screening blood now so that um, someone cannot contract from getting a blood transfusion. 
certainly using uh, personal protective equipment um, when handling um, blood or tissue samples, etc. There are additional, moving on to additional um, RNA viruses. These are negative single-stranded viruses uh, within the family of the paramyxoviridae. Um, there are four different groups. Nemorbidula virus, which causes measles. Respirovirus, which causes parainfluenza. Uh, rubella virus, which has the mumps virus. And pneumovirus, which has respiratory syncytial virus. The rhabdoviridae. Um, and then filoviridae. Measles, this is another one of your classical childhood diseases. It's also known as rubiola. It is usually used as the standard, if you will, um, of contagiousness. So things tend to be as determining how contagious something is compared to measles. Measles is considered one of the most contagious um, infections and diseases. It is more serious than the rubella or the German measles. Uh, this is a comparison of the two. Um, with the measles, it can be spread in the air by respiratory. Usually spread, you have a population of people, a group a crowd, and if one person has it, it typically is spread by droplets, so they're coughing, they're sneezing. And if you have somebody in there who, in the group that has not had it, look out because they're probably going to get it. The virus usually infects the respiratory tract, and then from there it can spread throughout the body. One of the classic things to look for is what's known as coplic spots. Uh, these are spots that appear on the a mucous membrane in the mouth. You then start to send the, see the skin lesions on the head, and then it spreads over the rest of the body. One concern with measles is that there are some complications. Usually they're rare, but Especially with adults, you, you need to be careful. It tends to be more severe in adults than in children. Uh, so you need to watch out for those secondary complications. Uh, the vaccine in the United States has been fairly effective. And I will tell you, they, the CDC had hoped to have measles eradicated from the United States in the 1990s. And we missed that date. Um, measles has been on the rise lately. Once again, a lot of it can be attributed back to the lack of vaccinations. In picture A, you're seeing the coplic spots, and in B, you can see the rash as seen on this child's face. And with charting here on this graph, once again, the introduction of the vaccine, the MMR vaccine in the 60s, it's very effective. You can see the dramatic decrease in the number of cases, but unfortunately, we have had this increase that we're seeing. Uh, and in 2019, there's a dramatic increase in, in measles. Hopefully, with education to get the importance of vaccination and that that can be preventive. Uh, you know, no child. No individual should have to suffer from some of these diseases if we have a very effective vaccine to prevent it. Diagnosis, once again, typically those coplic spots are, are certainly um, usually definitive for the, the diagnosis treatment. Uh, soon after exposure, you can try to give uh, anti-measles immunoglobin, uh, but once again, the vaccine. Uh, that does need a booster usually um, when you're in grade school. Parainfluenza causes respiratory tract diseases. Children are more, more susceptible than adults, transmitted by respiratory droplets and also person to person uh, contact. Depending on which of the strains you have, uh, three of them, one through three, cause lower respiratory infection and four. Uh, causes upper respiratory tract infections. One and two can cause croup, 
which is where you have inflammation of the larynx, the trachea, and the bronchia. Most patients are going to recover within a few days, so you don't need any type of special treatment. If the airways do become blocked, you may have to intubate. Mumps. Mumps virus is a causative agent. Um, transmission is usually by respiratory. Virus, once again, enters that upper respiratory system and then spreads uh, elsewhere in the body. You tend to, with mumps, have what we call peritidis. This is enlargement of the parotid salivary glands, which are located um, in the jaws in front of the ears. Um, you can have uh, other infections occur, other sites of inflammation occurring. Um, and so for some people, the infection may be asymptomatic. Recovery is usually complete. There's no specific treatment. Just once again, treat the symptoms. Try to keep the person as comfortable as possible. Uh, the mumps is the other part of the M on the measles, mumps, rubella. So the vaccine has been very effective once again in uh, decreasing the number of cases. As you can see here in this picture with the swollen, uh, some people used to refer to it as having like chipmunk cheeks because you get the swelling of that parotid salivary gland. And once again, with the advent of that vaccine, the number of cases have come down dramatically. Respiratory syncytial virus, known as RSV, causes a disease in the lower respiratory tract. Um, and this can be extremely severe and devastating. It can be fatal in infants and young children. Uh, older children and adults usually are asymptomatic. Um, this is something that typically, um, I know for many years I lived in near New Albuquerque, New Mexico, and there in the winter time, usually December through about February or early March, was when we tended to have outbreaks of RSV. Um, and once again, as we said here, it's it can be very severe in infants and children. So usually during those winter months, when cases were higher, they would not allow children in the hospital to visit other family members, just trying to decrease um, the chances of them getting sick. It does go in and infect in the um, cells and starts interfering at the alveoli of causing this, this syncytium or this, this large blockage. Um, which alveoli, that's the area in the lungs where the gas exchange occurs, so it starts interfering with that, and so you start having respiratory distress occurring. The virus can be transmitted by fomites, hands, respiratory droplets. Prevention, certainly remember that hand washing, especially with your healthcare workers and anyone dealing with young children. Rabies is caused by the rabies virus. What happens here with this virus is that um, usually a person uh, obtains the virus that's transmitted from a bite. And what happens is the virus is going to attach to a nerve cell, and then it does what we call the retrograde movement. And it's going to move it's kind of like it's flowing against the traffic in your nerve cell. So it infects at the axon. Most of the time things move like, think about an electrical impulse. It moves from the body, the cell body or the cell of a nerve cell down towards the end of the axon. Well, the virus is going to move the opposite way. It's going to travel up the axon to the, the main cell body and then it's going to travel to the next nerve until it infects the, sp the spinal cord and the brain. Uh, symptoms of rabies, hydrophobia, the sphere of water, seizures, disorientation, hallucination, and then finally paralysis. Um, this is what a vesicular stomatitis virus looks like. Uh, the main reservoir of rabies uh, depends on where you're living in urban areas. It's often in dogs, bats, 
can serve, usually most mammals can serve as uh, another reservoir of rabies. As I said earlier, transmission is usually occurs by bite. Uh, so you have a break in that skin. This shows in the United States here for rabies what some of the wild animals are. Skunks, foxes, raccoons, squirrels have been known to have the rabies uh, virus as well. I say most uh, mammals can carry it. Um, usually some of the neurological symptoms are going to be enough to be able to diagnose it. Um, once you wait to see the symptoms, it's too late to treat. That is why if you are bitten by a wild animal or if you are bitten by an animal that you suspect has rabies, you can't wait for the symptoms to appear and then start treatment. You need to start treatment right away at the site of the infection. Um, I remember years ago being told that in all of recorded history, there have only been supposedly five cases of where an individual was actually diagnosed with rabies after the symptoms appeared and then survived. So those aren't very good odds. You need to start treatment right away. What is the treatment? As I said, it's uh, injection of a human rabies immunoglobulin. Um, years ago, it used to be where you had to go for 21 consecutive days and receive this shot. Typically, they would give it in the abdomen. They have changed the procedure now. It's not nearly as... Um, it used to be really horrific to get a shot in the, the stomach every day. You become sensitized to it, so it's very, very painful. So at least it's improved some. It is still not pleasant. Um, prevention is the main thing to kind of control and prevent uh, the rabies from ever infecting animals. And so certainly we have a very strong vaccination program of your domesticated dogs and cats. And then the other thing is do not play with wild animals. Uh, recently there is a case of some individuals that saw a bat, they picked it up, they were passing around. Number one, if you see a bat on the ground, that's not normal. Don't touch it. Number two, it was during the day. Don't touch it. That should have been some red flag warnings right there that something wasn't normal with that bat. They ended up testing it, and yes, it had rabies, and all four people who handled and touched it had to be treated for the rabies. Um, if you take a tissue sample, you look for these Negri bottle bodies that are found in the south. Uh, the tissue for confirmation is going to be brain tissue, which means you would have to sacrifice the animal to test to see if it is positive or not. Some of the hemorrhagic fevers, uh, these are still negative single-stranded RNA viruses. Things such as the Marburg virus and Ebola virus are causative agents of these hemorrhagic fevers. Natural reservoir, they believe, are fruit bats. So yeah, the bats are getting a bad name here. Um, initial mode of transmission to humans, don't know. Tends, once it's in a human, it can be spread person to person by contaminated fluids. Healthcare workers must wear those protective PPEs, protective, personal protective equipment, uh, while working with Ebola uh, patients. This graph, uh, map is showing the outbreak um, of Ebola cases in Africa uh, from 1976 to August 2015. There have been uh, repeated outbreaks of Ebola. To work with Ebola, some of the protective equipment, uh, you can see on the left hand side a worker who is getting ready to go in and, and work with a patient who is positive for Ebola. The CDC has a bio level safety uh, level 4 lab. And 
before going in that lab, number one, you have to have training. You must uh, suit up in special protective uh, gear before going in. What they have done, they are obviously are suited up, and then those red coils that he's hooking up, that is the air. They are receiving <coughs> air filtered in, uh, respirators into that that sealed, the suits are sealed that they are in before they enter into the secure lab where they can then work with Ebola or any of um, the other organisms. In a, a level four lab, you are basically, you are working with either things that are unknown or things that frankly can kill you. So the Ebola virus, um, unfortunately, it's not attacking just one type of cells in the body. That's one reason why it's, it's so hard to treat. It attacks the liver cells, macrophages. It attacks several different cells throughout the body, and you end up with uncontrolled bleeding, which is why it's called hemorrhagic fever. Oh, if you look at the numbers, 90% mortality rate. They are working on trying to develop a vaccine against this. Uh, for right now, treatment, you've got to try to uh, replace the fluids, hopefully faster than they're losing it. Um, they did find one helpful thing. They had some healthcare workers who came down with Ebola while treating their patients. And one of the individuals who did survive, they found he had high levels of antibodies, which makes sense against the Ebola virus. They were able to purify some of those and use that as a therapy to treat a second healthcare worker who came down sick. And that was successful. So that is where some of the research has been going is developing that possibly as a treatment, but also looking at um, vaccine. Orthomix over ADI, uh, this would include your flu viruses, and then you have the bunya viridii and arena viridii. Uh, these normally infect animals. Some of them can be transmitted to humans. The flu virus are influenza. There's type A and type B. Um, the envelope has different glycoproteins that are important for attachment on it. It tends to have two different types. And then when you get mutations of these, um, that's when you can use strains. So we use those letter de designations to show the strains. So in this picture, you can see um, the different uh, proteins that are extending out on the surface of the coat of that capsid in it. Um, that's what's used for designating the strains of it. We have what we call antigenic drift and antigenic shift. So drift are just the mutations that can occur to get new strains of influenza A and influenza B. And that tends to occur regularly, frequently. Usually every year you have some type of mutations that will occur, and then you end up with a new strain. Antigenic shift is, involves influenza A. And this used to occur on a fairly regular basis about once every 10 years. And what would happen is the two different strains of the virus would enter a host cell and then um, basically there's a combination of genes and antigens. It's kind of like you're stirring the pot and you come up with a whole new, um, very different virus. And so that's years ago what used to happen with the antigenic drift if you got a slight mutation then if you were exposed last year and then this year you might just get a very mild version or you'd still be protected but antigenic shift where you have this major mixing of the pot if you will of the genes and the antigens are combined together and it's a really a completely new virus and so a lot more people would end up getting sick so that's why about every 10 years we used to see this 
For influenza, what are the signs and symptoms? Fever, malaise, headache, muscle soreness. Typically, the route of transmission, the entry route is by the respiratory. Incubation period is only about one day. This is one big thing right now that is different between earlier when I talked about coronavirus, which is 14 days. Incubation period here is one day. The virus starts immediately replicating in the lungs. Um, patients are more susceptible to secondary bacterial infections because of the damage done to the lungs. So how's the diagnosis done? Look at signs and symptoms within the community. You can run lab tests to be able to distinguish between the various strains. Is it A? Is it B? There are some treatments that um, can help, some medication that can help, um, but it must be started within um, early on within a couple days of being diagnosed or of, of actually getting the virus. So let's say you think you're sick and then you wait four days before going to the doctor and then it's diagnosed, it's going to be too late to start the treatment at that time. And the, the medication will help decrease the symptoms and decrease the length of time that you're sick. There are uh, vaccines. Um, the vaccines will protect you against those particular strains. There's multivalent, that means there's usually the vaccine is typically against three strains, sometimes four, but they, they'll ne they never want to go above four, and even four, they're a little hesitant. They usually like to look at the top three strains. The way they develop the vaccines uh, in the northern hemisphere, it, flu season is in the starts in the fall, extends through winter and early spring. So what they do is in late spring, early summer, the CDC and some of the virologist specialists will get together and analyze the data, see what were the most uh, prevalent strains of the flu in the spring. Not in the fall, they'll look at the spring. Because mutations may have occurred from between, say, October and March. So they look at the most prevalent strains in the spring, and then... Uh, members of the CDC here in the U.S., they discuss this with counterparts in Europe and Asia and South America, etc. And they try to determine, okay, so these are the top three strains. That's what we will use to produce the vaccine for the following fall. Now, they understand that mutations occur, and it may not be those strains, which is why sometimes you may get the vaccine and still get sick, because there might be a new strain out. It takes several months to produce the vaccine because it is grown in chicken eggs. By growing the virus in chicken eggs, that can also allow for mutations. We know that, but this is the best that we have. Viruses do not replicate on their own, so you have to grow them in something. So we use chicken eggs. Because it takes several months, that's why when suddenly in the fall and you have new flu season, and then suddenly people go, we have the flu, and they're testing and finding out, oh, there's a new strain, so the vaccine is not as effective. Well, then that, there is a mutation. There's one of these genetic, uh, it could have been either genetic shift or drift that occurred. <coughs> so they just do the best that they can. That's also why you need to get a new uh, vaccine every year. One thing, too, I will just say is that oftentimes you will hear people talk about how, oh, I had the 24-hour flu. There is no such thing as a 24-hour flu. If you get true influenza without treatment, you're going to be sick for about a week, typically 7 to 10 days. It's not 24 hours. Even if you start with medication right away, you're going to be sick for several days. If you get the quote-unquote 24-hour flu, what my suggestion would be is to look, when you started getting sick, look at what you ate or drank about 8 to 12 hours before you felt sick. You probably have food poisoning. 
In terms of bunioviruses, most of these are zoonotic pathogens, meaning they're uh, in animals and they're transmitted to humans by arthropods. Blame your mosquitoes again. This is showing an example of um, one of the bunioviruses in an envelope. It can cause the virus, the human pathogens in this. Um, the virus has caused Rift Valley fever, California encephalitis, and some hemorrhagic fevers. Um, some of these, the symptoms are usually mild. Now there is another type that's called a hantavirus. Um, what happens here is um, the virus infects um, deer mice. That's another host for it, is specifically the deer mouse. And the virus is released from the mouse in the urine and the feces. And usually what happens is humans inhale the virus that had been present in that urine and feces. This was first diagnosed in 1993 out in the Four Corners area, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Colorado. And um, I remember when this broke out, they were trying to figure out what was happening because the hantavirus causes the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Uh, very severe respiratory problem, as the name implies. Typically, what happens with this, we see increases of this in the spring and the summer. And they've learned now that as the deer mouse population increases, and they will mo actually monitor out there to give them clues as to for prevention. Um, Obviously, this area is a desert area in the Four Corners area, so if they have a lot of rain, which unfortunately they usually don't get much, but if they have increased rain, they usually see an increase in plant growth, which then results with an increase in the deer mouse population. If there's an increase in the deer mouse population, they've learned to expect an increase in hantavirus cases. What happens is like I say, we tend to get more cases in the spring and summer. It's when people are going to, say, their mountain cabins. They're doing their spring cleaning. They're cleaning out sheds, outbuildings, whatever, you know, these places that have been closed up that maybe had the mice in them for the winter. And you go in there, and you st what do you do? Spring cleaning. You're wiping down, and you start sweeping. Well, what happens when you sweep a dusty place? All that dust goes up in the air and the virus particles are in the air if there's mouse droppings in there. So the recommendation is if you're cleaning out a shed and is now out there is to wear a mask, um, or certainly if you see mouse droppings, maybe wear a mask and wet down. We used to take a, a diluted bleach solution and spray down if you saw droppings and then clean it out. Try to reduce your chance of inhaling it. Um, there's different strains of the hantavirus. Uh, it is very severe if you contract it. You often end up with a severe case of pneumonia. Oftentimes patients end, on, end up on both a not only a respirator but also a heart machine. Initially, uh, when it first broke out, in, like I said, it was in 93 and 94, the mortality rate was about 90%. It has decreased down some, it is still very high. Um, just FYI, the, the best hospital for treatment for hantavirus is actually um, the University of New Mexico Hospital in Albuquerque because that's from in that area. It's so rural in the Four Corners area, that's one of the closest hospitals, and so they're used to treating it. So they'll probably recognize it maybe quicker than other places. So diagnosis symptoms are very similar, obviously, to a lot of other uh, diseases. So they'll often use ELISA PCR um, prevention. Reduce that uh, for some of these viruses. Reduce that exposure to the insect vector. Um, Arena viruses. Um, there are some uh, ribosomes, it looks like, that they contain within them. 
So they're kind of unusual looking, look kind of sandy with them. Hemorrhagic fever, fevers um, are some examples, Lhasa, Wan, Sabia, and Machupo. Uh, they tend to be endemic in some of the rodent populations in Africa and South America. <coughs> Excuse me. They can be transmitted uh, to humans, give flu-like symptoms, transmitted by aerosols, contaminated food, fomites. Supportive care is going to be your primary treatment, and prevention is, once again, control that contact with the rodents. Hepatitis D virus is the causative agent of hepatitis D, transmitted through bodily fluids from sexual activity or um, contaminated needles. Uh, hepatitis D is kind of interesting in that it requires hepatitis B to be virulent because it cannot attach by itself to liver cells. Now, hepatitis D has been um, shown to play a role in uh, stimulating uh, liver cancer. So the idea is um, if you can prevent the spread of hepatitis B, because hepatitis D is dependent upon hepatitis B. If you prevent the spread of hepatitis B, then that should prevent the hepatitis D infection. Um, there is vaccination against hepatitis B, which seems to be helping to help also limit or decrease the spread of hepatitis D. The Rio Viridia. This double, in this double-stranded uh, RNA, you know, respiratory and enteric viruses, um, this will include the rotavirus and cultivirus. Rotaviruses, um, this is the most common cause of infantile gastroenteritis. So unfortunately, it is a significant cause of death in developing countries. It's transmitted by the fecal-oral route treatment. Replace the loss of water and electrolytes. Keep the person hydrated. Prevention. Here we go again. It's going to be good hygiene, proper sewage treatment. Uh, there is a vaccine that can help provide some protection. This is what rotavirus looks like. Deaths from the rotavirus uh, 2012 are shown here. Arbovirus uh, causes uh, Colorado tick fever. Usually the infection is going to be mild, have fever and chills. Sometimes individuals can get more severe cases. Um, there's no specific treatment to it because it is transmitted by ticks. Once again, prevent that transmission. So here is a list showing um, the various RNA viruses uh, that infect humans, the family name, whether it's a single uh, or double strand, is it positive or negative, is it enveloped or naked without that envelope, and what are some of the um, representative viruses and the diseases that they cause. So this is a nice summary sheet here.